Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. GJ. Just enough architecture, just in time. The idea that you only create the architectural guidance you need just as it's about to be consumed. Almost a truism. Anyone who's actually worked in large or EA efforts knows it's like sweeping up leaves in a forest. By the time you've reached one side, your starting point needs doing again. And so you have to have a coping mechanism. And for those who are seeking to use AEA guidance, they need to be able to rely on it being absolutely bang up to date. So why is it so hard? Well, when I used to work in manufacturing, we called just in time, just too late. And that's what we have to avoid. So the trick is, how can we know what to architect and when it may be needed? Answer, it's all about demand and forecasting the supply to meet it. We need an EA backlog that prioritizes an EA work plan based upon captured demand with burn down rates and release schedules. Hmm, those sound like future topics. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining us today on Talk It Tuesday. Uh, I'm Steve Nunn, CEO and President of the Open Group, and I'd like to give you a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it, it's uh, it's now, I think, number it's either number three or four. I'm having so much fun. I'm not, I'm not sure in the series of Talk It Tuesdays, but uh, uh, I'd like to uh, thank. Before I go on, I'd like to thank Paul Homan there, who you just just saw on his uh, EA Minute. Uh, Paul Homan of IBM, um, a great contributor to the Open Group over the years and the current co-chair of the Architecture Forum, in fact. So uh, thank you, Paul, for that. Paul is one of our panel of experts here at Toolkit Tuesday, and uh, you'll hear more from him in future episodes. Um, but it's a, it's a, a a great reminder um, of what just in time uh, really means and uh, and how important it is. So thank you, Paul, for that. Um, I hope wherever you are, uh, those joining us, um, that you're you're safe and well. Uh, just a couple of tips for getting the best out of your WebEx experience today. If you can um, make sure that uh, in your settings, if you go to your layout in your settings, that you have um, the automatically hide names when not speaking ticked or checked whatever your uh, preferred word please uh, have that highlighted and um, um, please have un make sure that you have unchecked the um, show video when not when not speaking so uh, that will give you the best experience you are able to adjust the size of the uh, uh, of, of the panels here for this for the speakers but um, Without further ado, we're going to going to press on with our with our main topic today. And today we are we're addressing um, not for the only time I'm sure in the series, but we're we're addressing the uh, the great topic of enterprise architecture and agile. And uh, today we're going to look at the evolution of enterprise architecture and agile approaches, um, the fundamental challenges they present for architects, and how and why these approaches need to adapt. We'll also consider how the tools from the Open Group can enable enterprise architects to benefit from the partnership of enterprise architecture and Agile. And you'll get a clue from there that we very much see this as a partnership, not something, uh, not two things that just are not compatible with each other, um, which is sometimes suggested. So 
To do this today, I'm very happy to introduce another of our panel of experts and uh, another great contributor to the Open Group over the years uh, and currently, uh, Mr. Chris Frost, who is Principal Architect, Enterprise Architect uh, for Global Delivery at Fujitsu. Chris has worked at Fujitsu since 2005 in a variety of leading technical roles. Um, his present role provides standard services, technical guidelines and support for the global Fujitsu group. In the open group, he led the TOGAF Agile Working Group during the course of last year, doing some great work and is a contri and contributing currently to a number of current architecture forum activities. Before his time at Fujitsu, Chris worked for EDS, which is now part of DXC, on several large contracts for the Ministry of Defence in the UK. And in earlier years, he worked for Ford, Shell and a small startup software house called Shamrock Marketing. So we're in great hands today to uh, hear more about uh, enterprise architecture and agile methods. Uh, a warm virtual welcome um, to Toolkit Tuesday for Mr. Chris Frost. Over to you, Chris. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, just give me one second and I will start the sharing so that everybody can, can see my slides. Okay, we should be good there. Okay, so thanks very much. So uh, hello everybody and uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, my name is Chris Frost and as Steve said, I'm with Fujitsu. I'm part of our uh, global delivery architecture team. And uh, yeah, as Steve has already said, I am gonna be talking today about uh, enterprise architecture, enterprise agility and the TOGAF standard. And I want to start off by looking at the history of some of these things, because I think it's through that you, that you can best understand how these things have developed and what it really means to use these things together. So if I start off by looking at some of the uh, history from enterprise architecture, you can really trace the development of this back to around about the middle of the 1980s when a couple of important things were published. Uh, the Zachman framework, which I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with and will recognize, and a thing called the PRISM research report. And they were both really looking into this problem of how do you do large scale business change related to business needs and do that in a sort of logical, organized fashion. And if we move on to the early 1990s, uh, important thing there from the enterprise architecture point of view was TAFIM. TAFIM, Enterprise Architecture Method, uh, created and published by the US government. And importantly in the history here, this is really the first time at which you see the term enterprise architecture used uh, as we know it now. And for those of you who might be uh, TOGAF historians, uh, you'll know that from TAFIM, you can trace a direct line to TOGAF version one, published in 1995. And then since then, we've had uh, a number of versions of TOGAF. Um, we're now currently at uh, TOGAF ver version nine. Um, major version nine was first published 9.0 in uh, 2009. And we're now at uh, 9.2. If we turn to um, agile methods, again, similarly, you can trace those origins back to the uh, early 1980s because around this time, there was some study into this problem of how do you make software development um, a little bit more predictable and a little bit less uncertain. And there's this thing called the spiral model published in, uh, in the middle of the 1980s, uh, 1986, I think. Um, and that was really putting forward this idea of starting with a, a small core of working software and then gradually building on that, going around cycles of development and planning and sort of the notion of expanding out in, in spirals. Um, and these ideas uh, led on to uh, rapid application development, RAD, published in 1991, a chap called James Martin, which was then sort of introducing this idea of these regular reviews with uh, business representatives and doing these short feedback cycles. Uh, and then a major milestone in the development of Agile methods, 1995, a publication of Scrum, 
from the uh, paper by Jeff Schwaber. Uh, and this really introduced some of the fundamental concepts as we know them today, the idea of the, the sprints and some of the sprint ceremonies and the sprint planning and so on. Interestingly, in the Scrum paper, you won't actually find the term agile at all. That doesn't really come along until the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and in particular, we have the Agile Manifesto in 2001. Uh, and moving on from there, um, really the, the study has turned to how can we apply some of these ideas at scale, moving up from the idea of the, uh, of the single software development teams. Uh, and how can we apply them to more things than just software development? So, for example, we had uh, SAFE published in uh, 2007 from Dean Leffingwell's book and Disciplined Agile, DAD, um, by Scott Ambler, 2014. So there's a couple of things in particular I want you to take from, uh, from this piece of history. Um, first of all, that these two things, enterprise architecture and Agile, are pretty much the same sort of age. Um, any notion that somehow Agile is the new kid on the block is, is, is actually not factually correct. Um, you can see the histories are very similar. Uh, and in particular, you know, by coincidence, 1995 happens to be TOGAF version one and the publication of Scrum. Um, so these things are similar ages. But through most of this, uh, the development of these two things has been uh, essentially separate. And that's because really they're looking at different fundamental challenges. Enterprise architecture is really looking at that question of how do you tackle large scale business change, business change affected by IT. Uh, and doing all of those system design things that you need to do, uh, and doing that by linking the IT change to your business strategy, and then decomposing those large problems into smaller pieces that you can actually tackle and solve, and then how do you organize your solution development process to essentially reassemble all of those pieces back into one big overall solution. So it's that sort of at scale that's the key there. Agile methods have really looked at this uh, question of uncertainty. How do we reduce uncertainty in software development cycles by these ideas of the rapid learning and feedback cycles, short incremental development, and the collaborative working in autonomous and multi-skilled teams? And these two slightly different fundamental challenges really uh, point the way to how we need to adapt these things if we want them to work together. Now, you might ask, why would I want them to work together? Why is that important? Why would I want to do that? And that's an excellent question, and I'll come to that in the next slide. But just for a moment, think about how we would adapt these things. From an enterprise architecture standpoint, what you've got to be thinking about is how do I develop my architecture in an iterative way? And then from that architecture, when I'm thinking about how I would govern the uh, solution development, doing that in continuous ways, uh, incrementally with the development of the solution development, and very importantly, prioritizing the delivery of the first working system components as soon as possible. So descending through the layers of architecture, or through the design, getting the first working system components out as soon as possible. Then if I look at things from an agile viewpoint, um, then yeah, I need to accept the necessity of some design up front, not big design up front, but some design up front. And coming from that, the, the architecture guardrails that you see commonly talked about in agile methods and trusting those guardrails, they are there for a good reason. They are there to help us succeed. So I mentioned the importance of adapting. Why do we need to do that? Well, I think if we don't, there are some very genuine risks. Um, from an enterprise architecture standpoint, um, there is a risk of building the wrong system. Uh, I don't have any doubt at all that by correctly executing all of the processes, you will build a system that works. 
but it might not be quite the system as the end user really intended it. You know, I'm sure a lot of us will have had those moments where you've got the business owner perhaps sat in front of you and they'll say, yeah, okay, I can see, yes, you can tick off all of the functional requirements I gave you, but it's somehow not quite what I wanted. And I would also say there's a risk of irrelevance, don't use the word lightly, um, irrelevance in digital transformation programs, because unless we follow these agile approaches and doing these rapid iterative delivery, we risk just simply being too slow because in digital transformation, the emphasis is, is in responding to disruption or new market opportunity. And so speed is the key and these agile methods gives us a way to get working results out more quickly. And from an agile standpoint, when we're talking about doing things at scale, if we don't use some of these enterprise architecture techniques, then there's a very real risk of integration fail failure with those large scale systems. In particular, where you've perhaps got multiple teams working on separate aspects of the problems. If you don't have those sorts of overarching architectures, those patterns uh, and those principles that everybody needs to follow, then there's a risk that those pieces just simply will not fit together. Uh, and another one is breaching non-functional requirements because when you're following a development that is essentially led by um, end user interactions, by business owner interactions, the focus very naturally tends to be on the, on the functional behaviors. Um, you know, the things that you see on the screen, the buttons you click, the reports that are generated. And sometimes it's rather too late in the development cycles that things like um, capacity come out. Oh, by the way, there could be a million of these things a day. Or, oh, by the way, um, you need to be able to support perhaps 10,000 concurrent users. And those come too late in the development cycles, you can have a serious problem. And broadly speaking, these are the sorts of problems that emergent architecture alone can't solve. So if I'm an architect, what are the sorts of things I need to be considering as we go through these different stages uh, of the architecture development? Um, while I'm developing the architecture itself, while I'm in that architecture project, the sorts of things I need to be thinking about are how am I dividing up the architecture uh, into sprint size increments that I can deliver incrementally through the ADM cycles? And of course, TOGAF gives me some ways to do that straight out of the book. Uh, very easy to see how by dividing the work up according to those domains of business, data, application and technology, uh, or by the levels of strategic architecture segment capability. You know, that obviously gives me some very easy ways that I can divide that work up into, into chunks of work that I can deliver it iteratively. And as I mentioned before, uh, getting to that first what TOGAF calls the capability level architecture, the lowest level of architecture as soon as possible so that in turn I can get on to the uh, first parts of the solution development as soon as possible and be producing those first working components of the system, showing the business owners uh, the first working components, showing some business value, and of course, starting those cycles of learning and feedback. And when I'm then as an architect thinking about what sort of things do I need to be doing as we're working with the construction teams, the build teams, developing the solution, then it's those things of building the architecture, setting the architecture guardrails, uh, creating the runway and governing not through those sort of fixed stage gates, not by uh, asking the development team to come to some big architecture board review in two months time, but by continuous interactions, working with the development teams on a much more continuous ongoing basis and doing things like uh, joining, possibly joining in some of those Arab, um, agile ceremonies as you go through the development process. And then when it comes to the operational end of the life cycle, the sort of things I need to be thinking about as an architect when I'm thinking about the solution operation is how is this solution going to be agile in operation? And in particular, I would single out functionality and capability uh, and, and capacity. So how do I make this solution agile to adapt to changes in functionality? How do I introduce new functions or change functions? And it's 
these sorts of concentrations that often lead you down the path of perhaps um, microservices architecture and that sort of thing and canary testing and all these sorts of things. And how do I make it adaptable to capacity? How do I scale up? How do I scale down? Um, and the techniques that there are in, uh, in, in design and construction to enable easy ch changes of capacity. So the good news is the open group is, is working on all of these things. Uh, there is a TOGAF Agile working group, uh, which uh, has already published some things and continues to work. Um, it is very much a team effort. Uh, new members always welcome, as it says on the slide. And uh, uh, seriously, if you want to get involved, if you want to contribute, uh, we would welcome you uh, joining in these efforts. Uh, the group leader is Richard Gunitsky uh, from Full Stack Architecture. Uh, if you Google Richard Gunitsky Full Stack Architecture, you will find him. And if you are interested in joining, then by all means, get in touch with Richard. Um, he would uh, welcome your contributions. And as an example of some work in progress, something that uh, I've been working on myself, uh, I've been looking at the problem of agile documentation. Because although you know, the documentation is very much the, the, the outputs often of what you're doing in architecture, by making sure you do that in an agile way, it sort of sets a certain cadence right through the whole approach. Um, and so like everything, it's about developing the documentation incrementally um, and using tool sets that support collaboration and automation in what you're doing. And finally, don't forget the needs of long term access you know, where you've got where you've got your documents perhaps stored in some sort of agile tool set or some DevOps tool chain. That's great during the development program. But think about how would I access that perhaps in five years time if I've now got some perhaps some sort of archive copy of that database, but the tool chain has moved on three or four major versions of software. How sure am I? I'll still be able to read that stuff in maybe five years time. So think about perhaps exporting to proven stable file formats, something like a PDF. So I'll close out uh, by saying there's already quite a lot of useful information in the TOGAF library about all of this. There is a very good white paper using agile practices and enterprise architecture, um, the core TOGAF standard documentation that's there now. Version 9.2 has an entire chapter on implying iterations to the ADM. And uh, there is the uh, open agile architecture standard. And these uh, little codes I've put in bold on the slide here. Uh, these are the uh, document code numbers. And if you go to the TOGAF library and put that in the search bar, that's the quickest way to get to these documents. Happy to say there will be additional guidance published soon about um, about agile working, things like I mentioned, like uh, MSA, how to introduce new technologies, uh, and many other topics that are relevant to DX. So embrace these new approaches, and I would say be more Jedi. And that isn't an, an appeal to some sort of mystical, all-encompassing force. That is just enough design in front, because that's the real key of this agile approach, doing just enough at each stage to enable the next step. So embrace these new approaches, be agile, be more Jedi. And with that, Steve, I will hand back to you. Chris, that's great stuff. Thank you very much uh, for leading us through there. Um, there's lots in there and people will get the slides in the chat channel. Uh, you'll be you'll be notified when the recordings and the, and the presentation is available. So thank you very much for that, Chris. We don't have loads of times for questions, but we uh, we will uh, take a couple of minutes if we if we can now. Um, the question come up in the chat about documentation, and uh, uh, you you, meant, you mentioned it as uh, needing some, and the agile um, manifesto, of course, um, stresses the importance of working software over comprehensive documentation. So. What what's uh, can can you kind of go back to the documentation point and say what, what's the your your suggested uh, approach on documentation here? You clearly said you yep. need some. Yep. So. Yes, that's right. And you know, people often do point back to the Agile Manifesto and this uh, and what it says there about valuing software over over documentation. Of course, that's entirely right because you know at the end of the day, it is that working software you want. But um, 
if you go on to read the Anya Manifesto, it does acknowledge very clearly that, that there is value in things like the documentation. And if you, again, if you read the, the history of the Anya Manifesto, um, it does explain that it's not an anti-documentation thing. Um, so, you know, the, the trick is to always just do the minimum necessary to enable that next step, that next iteration. But do make sure you do that minimum because it's all too easy to kind of undershoot. Yeah, it, it, it's right. a it's a tricky balance to strike, but it always always that principle of doing just enough. Right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and I'll do um, one one more quick question, which is, we you've mentioned that Scrum goes back to uh, kind of the same date as the first version of the Toto yeah. standard. Um, we've heard a lot in recent years, recent times about safe. Um, and here at the open group, we've obviously had TOGAF for a, for a while now, and it's being uh, constantly um, maintained and updated. And the open agile architecture standard you referred to. So, why are we working on those? I think I know the answer, but for the for the audience, why are we working on those when we have Scrum and Safe? Scrum and Safe are very excellent, um, essentially sort of project control mechanisms, you know, quite generalized talking about how you organize your work and organize your people and, and um, even going right up to the sort of strategy side of things. Um, but they are not architecture methods. So, you know, if Scrum and Safe both acknowledge the need for architecture, but they do not tell you how to do it. Um, whereas by contrast, for example, TOGAF is very rich in all of those things. There are many, many guides available that tell you how to do business architecture, how to do application architecture, and all of those things that are in the ADM cycle. So it's really that slightly different emphasis that TOGAF clearly and, and things like that OAA focus on architecture, which are necessary and acknowledged in these other things like SAFE and SCRUM, but not covered in detail in things like SAFE and SCRUM. Right, right. Well, um, we'll leave it there, Chris, in the in, in the interest of time. Um, but uh, again, a warm, uh, a warm, wel uh, not warm welcome, warm thank you for, uh, for your presentation today. And uh, and uh, we will be making the slides available as well to answer a question in the, in the chat. I think somebody's already done that. But um, for now, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Chris Frost. And you, uh, right now, before we wrap up, folks, we will move to uh, an, another of our panel of experts, Terry Blevins, who you, if those, those of you who were present uh, last time around on Talk It Tuesday will have seen the first of uh, Terry's Toolkit Tuesday tips. So uh, today we have the second. So Terry Blevins from Enterprise Wise. Um, we will hear him talk about a highly valuable but uh, often underutilized tool in the uh, Enterprise Architects Toolkit, um, Business Scenarios. Over to you, Terry. Hi, my name is Terry Blevins with the Toolkit Tuesday tip. So you have been asked to work on an enterprise architecture and you are wondering where I should start. That's a great question. And to be honest, I have seen efforts fail because this question didn't get the deserved attention up front. Well, if you don't know, the TOGAS standard has an excellent approach for addressing this. It is called the business scenario method. The business scenario method helps you understand where the organization is feeling the most pain. So your work as an enterprise architect could be focused on real issues. The business scenario method helps you and the organization itself get a better understanding of the high level requirements and constraints that need attention. The mess method also helps you understand how to bring in the right people in the organization to pull out the real pain points and the ramifications of not dealing with those pain points. Getting development operations and management people together helps build trust, generate a shared understanding of priorities and establish bridges that down the road will make it easier to implement change. Getting people on the same sheet of music usually does generate a better performance. The business scenario method is used to generate insights and agreements of the desired outcomes and capabilities. As well, the me method helps you understand the value chains involved and the value propositions facilitated 
by addressing the pain points. All of the above adding up to a better understanding of the real no kidding requirements motivating the enterprise architecture, which will enable change within the enterprise. The business scenario method helps you provide the necessary enterprise architecture capability of understanding real requirements, which you can provide through a service delivery model. By implementing the business scenario method, your enterprise architecture efforts will be dealing with the right issues. Of course, for more information, please check out the TOGAF library. Keep architecting for enterprise value. Thanks for watching. Thank you again, Terry Blevins, for that. Yes, for more information about the uh, business scenarios, you can find that in the, in the TOGAF library at the Open Group website. Um, that is it for today, folks, uh, for today's episode of Toolkit Tuesday. Um, please join us um, next time, uh, two weeks two weeks' time, when we'll be hearing about the seven levers or levers of digital transformation, depending on your preferred uh, pronunciation of the word. The seven levers or levers of, of digital transformation. It's a great, uh, we have a white paper on the topic. It's a great um, presentation that you'll hear from Dave Hornford of Connexium. Um, so please join us two weeks today for the next episode of Talk It Tuesday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, keep well, keep safe, um, and keep ent uh, keep architecting for enterprise value, as Terry, Terry uh, left us with that closing thought. So um, we'll see you in two weeks. Meanwhile, uh, I'm Steve Nunn. Thank you for joining Talk It Tuesday. <laughs>